We'll begin section 1.4 by talking about continuity. We're going to start by looking at continuity at a point. And of course, we're talking at a specific point where x is equal to c. That means that there's no interruption in the graph of f at c. So there's three ways in which a function can be discontinuous at x equals c. If you'll look at the first one, I have f of c is undefined. So I've, even though the limit of this function would exist because the function approaches the same value from the left and from the right, the function itself is undefined at c. We've got a hole in the graph at c. And because of that, because there is a hole, f of c would be undefined. The next would be that the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist. So we've already talked about the ways in which a limit does not exist. And one of them is that the function approaches a different value from the left and from the right. So obviously these are two different values. And so this is a gap. There is a gap in the graph. And the last is the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not equal f of c. So again, if this is c, then this point right here is f of c, but it doesn't fit with the rest of the graph. So even though the limit exists and f of c exists, they don't fall in line with one another. So again, this is a whole, just like our first example. So for a function to be continuous, then essentially all of the discontin discontinuities can't happen. So f of c must be defined, the limit must exist, and those two things must be equal to one another. Now that we know continuity at a point, we want to look at continuity on an open or closed interval. So a function is continuous on an open interval, a, b, when the function is continuous at each point on the interval. So any of these points, we can say that the limit from the left and from the right and the function itself equals one another. Now for an open interval, we're, we don't care about those endpoints. We only care about what's in the middle. That's why it's an open interval. So this is kind of like the um, greater than, and this is kind of like less than. Hopefully we already know that about interval notation. So if we're looking then um, at a closed interval, this would be like, greater than or equal to, and this would be like less than or equal to. So it has to include that endpoint as well. So for a function to be continuous on a closed interval, it must first be continuous on the open interval, and then the limit as x approaches a from the right has to equal f of a. So if this is a, then the limit from the right has to equal the actual endpoint f of a. And at B, same thing, from the left, the limit has to equal f of B. Now, if you have a function that's continuous over the entire number line, so obviously open interval because you can never contain infinity, that's called continuous everywhere or everywhere continuous. Some discontinuities are considered removable and some are non-removable. So let's talk about how we know the difference. If you have a function where all you have to do is define or redefine f of c, that's considered a removable discontinuity. This typically happens when you have a hole in your graph. So notice here where I had a hole or here where I had a hole. These two instances, all I would have to do is redefine that function to be f of c at that point. Same thing here, if this is C, all I would have to do is redefine F of C to be that point. Now, what happens when I don't have a removable discontinuity? Obviously it's called non-removable, and that typically happens when there is a gap like this, sometimes called a jump, a gap or a jump, or if you have an asymptote. That is where you are going to have non-removable discontinuity. So removable is where I have a hole and I can just fill in that hole. And non-removable is where I have a gap where I'd have to actually redefine the function or an asymptote 
where um, that function is essentially not defined at that point. We're going to do four practice questions, and we're going to start by looking at these analytically, which means I'm not going to look at the graph of the function. I'm going to determine just by what I know about functions. So we're going to start with y equals sine of x. And again, analytically means I'm not talking about the graph of the function. I'm determining based on what I know about, in this case, the sine function itself. And what I know about the sine function is that it has no asymptotes, that it looks like this. Again, yes, that's looking at the graph of the function. So I'm saying I know that sine is defined everywhere. Any x value that I put in, I'm going to get some value of sine. So this is considered continuous everywhere. Now, again, if you haven't taken trigonometry, you probably don't know that. So you definitely want a solid background in trigonometric functions before you dive into the calculus course. For our second one, we have f of x equals one over x. So this is called a rational function, rational from ratio, meaning that there's a fraction involved. And when I have a rational function, I'm always concerned about the denominator. I don't want it to equal zero. So in this case, I can see that this is going to be um, discontinuous at x equals zero, because if x was equal to zero, then I would have one divided by zero. And mathematically, that means it's undefined. Now the question says, if the function is discontinuous, tell whether those points are removable or non-removable. So it's discontinuous at x equals zero. And is it removable? Well, we already talked about the fact that if you had an asymptote or if you had a gap or a jump, that it's not removable. So what's this? Well, maybe you kind of know what this graph looks like, or maybe you don't. So again, we're going to look analytically. We're going to look at the limit as x approaches our point of discontinuity, in this case zero, from the left of our function, and the limit as x approaches zero from the right of our function. And once we know that, then we'll see if this is removable or not. If those two functions have the same limit, then we know it's removable. And if it's different limits, then it's not removable. So if I look at zero from the left, so zero from the left would be values like negative 0.0001, very small number. And you could continue making that smaller and smaller because it's getting closer to zero. So as this number gets bigger, I'm taking one divided, I'm sorry, this number gets smaller. I'm taking one divided by an increasingly small number, which means this is getting increasingly bigger. But because it's a negative, it's a very big negative number. Also known, whoops, switch colors there just for fun. Also known as negative infinity. Now, if I do the exact same thing, but now it's positive, then I'm going to end up with positive infinity. So this is going to be negative infinity from the left and positive infinity from the right. That should tell you that it's an asymptote and therefore this is a non-removable discontinuity at x equals zero. Now let's look at our next function. Our next function is g of x equal x squared minus one over x minus one. Again, I'm going to start by looking at the denominator. We can't let that equal zero. So it's discontinuous at x equals one because one minus one is zero. So you can just set it equal to zero and solve if you need to show the work. Now, is it removable? Well, here's what you have to pay attention to, again, in a rational function. If I can factor, and the numerator here would factor into x plus one, whoops, x plus one, x minus one. If it factors and that point of discontinuity cancels, then it's considered a removable discontinuity at x equals one. If it doesn't cancel, let's say just for fun, I also had an x minus two down here, which would mean it was discontinuous at x equals one and at x equals two. But x equals two, that's, that x minus two doesn't cancel with anything in the numerator, and therefore this would be an asymptote. But this would be a whole, 
which is removable. So just keep that in mind as you're working with rational functions. So I'm gonna get rid of all of that because that wasn't our original function. So it's removable discontinuity at x equals one. Looking at the last one, I have a piecewise function. A piecewise function basically takes your domain and puts it into different pieces. So this is saying anything to the left of zero and including zero, and then of course anything to the right of zero. So to the left of zero, I'm dealing with the function x plus one. So to the left of zero, I know that x plus one is just a linear function. y equals x plus one is a linear function. Linear functions continuous everywhere. To the right of zero, I've got the function x squared plus one. That's a quadratic function. And a quadratic function is continuous everywhere. No asymptotes in quadratic functions. So what I know right now is to the left of zero and to the right of zero, this function is continuous. So the only point that I'm a little bit concerned about is at the point x equals zero. So how do I determine what happens at x equals zero? Well, I look at what happens on the function at the left when I plug in zero, and that is that I get one. And what happens to the function on the right as I plug in zero, and I get one, and because those two things are equal, then this function is going to be continuous. It was continuous to the left, continuous to the right, and the two parts meet up at zero comma one. I want to look again at those same four functions that we just looked at analytically. And I do want to point out that I'm going to use Desmos for this, so you can certainly use your TI-84 or 83 um, Desmos, I think, is super friendly, so we're going to use that. So if you'll notice, I've already entered the functions over here, um, and when we get to the piecewise function, I'll show you how to enter that correctly. So let's start with y equals sine of x. So we can see all across anywhere of sine of x, the function is defined. So that is continuous everywhere. We could zoom way out, and we could see that it's going to continue to be that way. So that is our sine function, continuous everywhere. Our next function was y equals 1 over x, and we talked about the fact that it was discontinuous at 0, and also that it approached negative infinity from the left and positive infinity from the right. So we can see exactly what's happening there is our function is going in different directions. That's clearly a non-removable discontinuity. Our third function we said was continuous, um, except at the point x equals 0. So this is why I chose to use Desmos instead of your graphing calculator, because on your graphing calculator and on Desmos, it looks like it's continuous everywhere. But if I go to the point 1, notice it says 1 comma undefined. So we can see that it is, in fact, undefined at that point. But if I just look at the graph, it looks like it's defined. It's not going to give me that circle. So because it's hard to tell, that obviously is what makes this a removable discontinuity. All I would have to do is define the point 1 comma 2, and that would make this a continuous function. And then let's take a look, before we look at the graph, let's take a look at how I entered that piecewise function. This is how you can do that. So notice I've started with the domain, x is less than or equal to 0, and then a colon, and then x plus 1, and then a comma to do the second part of my piecewise function. The domain x is greater than 0, and then a colon, and then x squared plus 1. So that is what our piecewise function was. And again, we can see that this function is going to approach 1 from the left, and then it also approaches one from the right, so it is, in fact, a continuous function. I wanna finish up with two practice questions, uh, both having to do with discuss the continuity. It seems like kind of a vague um, instruction, discuss the continuity of this function, so I wanted to break it down for you. Here's what you're being asked to do. Look at the domain of the function. Is it continuous, I'm sorry, is the domain all values of x? Is it only a certain domain? This should give you an open, closed, or mixed interval for you to focus on. Then determine any points of discontinuity of the function. So see if it's, there is a possible discontinuity. If there is, make sure that you um, see if it's discontinuous at that point, if it's removable, non-removable, and so on. And then if you have a closed interval or 
if either endpoint in fact is closed, then ensure that the limit as x approaches that point is equal to the function at that point um, on either side. So let's do one practice together, then I'll have you do one on your own. This is a piecewise function. We just looked at a piecewise function, so we're familiar with how it works. And again, if I look at it analytically, I know that when x does not equal 3, this is a continuous function. And when x does equal 3, this is a continuous function. So the only point that I have to be concerned about is when x is equal to 3. So when x is equal to 3, the actual function is defined as 1. When x equals 3, y is 1 which means in order for this function to be continuous, 2x minus 4 has to equal 1. So 2 times 3 minus 4 is 6 minus 4, which is 2, and 2 does not equal 1. So is this continuous or not? No, this is discontinuous at x equals 3. Now, what was the domain of my function? I kind of skipped over that, so let's go back to it. The domain of my function is everywhere. Anything that's not equal to three and anything that is equal to three, that is the domain of my function. So what is my interval? Negative infinity to infinity. What are the points of discontinuity? X equals three. Is it removable? Yes, it's removable because all I would have to do is redefine f of 3 to be 2, and then it would be a, um, a continuous function. And again, because this is an open interval, I don't have to worry about the either endpoint. Here's one for you to try. So give this a try, and when you're ready, press play to see how you did. Again, we have the function f of x is equal to the square root of 4 minus x squared. And I threw this one in here because it's a radical function. And again, I'd like to try to review things that we should know about different types of functions. So we know for a radical function that the domain is that the radicand, that's the part inside, has to be greater than or equal to zero. Because if I take the square root of a negative value, obviously I end up with an imaginary number and that's not what I want. So determine the domain of my function. That means I'm going to take my 4 minus x squared and say that has to be greater than or equal to 0. If I add x squared to each side, I get 4 is greater than or equal to x squared. And then let's just go ahead and rewrite that for fun. x squared is less than or equal to 4. Now, if I take the square root of 4, I should get plus or minus 2. So again, hopefully we remember that this means this is negative 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the domain is not everything. The domain is negative 2 to positive 2, both closed interval. Determine any points of discontinuity. Well, the only point where this would be discontinuous is where it's not in the domain. So say if I plugged in a 3, well, 4 minus 3 squared is 4 minus 9. That's negative 5. I'm going to end up with an imaginary number. So even though obviously we have points of discontinuity, they're all outside of the domain, and so we don't have to worry about them. Um, if either endpoint of your interval is closed, check, check. Ensure that the left endpoint, the limit, is the same as the value of the function. And on the right endpoint, same thing. So again, as I get closer and closer to negative 2, what's happening to my radicand? Well, I'm going to get closer and closer to 0, which is what I want, right? 4 minus the square root. And then if I actually plug in negative 2, that gives me 0. So yes, we can see that this is going to approach 0 um, from each side. And the same thing is going to happen when x is equal to 2. 4 minus 2 squared is 4 minus 4, which is 0. And the square root of 0 is 0. So our function and our limit are, in fact, the same. Now that we understand the concept of continuity, we want to take a look at some properties of continuity.